So let me begin by saying what an attosecond is. It's incredibly short. So an attosecond is to a second as a second is to the age of the universe. Can you imagine something so short as that? I could say it differently. An attosecond is a billionth of a second, and you take one of those billionth of a second and a billion again, and that's an attosecond. A billionth of a billionth of a second is one attosecond. Now, electrons move on the time scale of attoseconds. You sort of know that because they go such short distances in, say, atoms and molecules. And they're very light, so they move very fast. And the forces on electrons are really strong. And so they change their environment in a few tens of attoseconds. And so if you want to look at electrons and you want to see what happens to them, then you need attosecond science. For example, you might try to do something to an atom, and how fast do all the electrons respond to that? How fast do they get in? And that's the fastest time scale that electrons are able to have in materials. I think it's for the model of how you make attosecond pulses. And it's incredibly simple, so I can explain it to you, an audience that probably doesn't know about attosecond science, to start with. So I do it by an analogy. I grew up by the ocean in New Brunswick. And so you may not have grown up by the ocean, but probably everybody's been by to the ocean. And you see seaweed on a rock. And you can watch a rock, a wave come in, and it picks up the seaweed, and it moves it up, and it brings it back down again, and it crashes into the rock from which it left. So that's the analogy of how attosecond pulses work. Imagine an atom. That's the rock. Along comes a light wave. That's the wave. It's a wave of force on an electron, just like a water wave is a wave of force on a seaweed. It pulls the electron away from the atom, but then it drives it back again, and it crashes into the atom from which it left. And in that crash, you create an attosecond pulse, or maybe a few tens of attoseconds. And that's how it's done. It's not that simple. It's hard to see the future, so you don't really know, really. I think one thing to think about is We've learned to make attosecond pulses in atoms. We've learned to do it in molecules quite quickly after atoms. More recently, we've learned that attosecond pulses can be created in solids. Solids like a piece of glass. Solids like a semiconductor or something like that. And so we've now brought attosecond pulses together with modern solid-state physics. And modern solid-state physics knows how to structure the surface of materials with exquisite precision. It's amazing what they can do. And so we can bring these attosecond pulses and this exquisite control over surfaces of materials and learn to focus the attosecond pulses to very, very small sizes. The matter of fact, these will be very, I mean, probably, I, well, maybe there are other ways to do it, but this will be an easy way to do it. Um, now, that's important for solids, it's important for maybe electronics, it's important for things like that, but it's also important for biology. Imagine yourself, you're made of cells. Inside the cells, what makes the cells interesting is that there are all kinds of little compartments called organelles, and the size of these organelles is very small, on the order of about 50 or 60 nanometers in size. And so if we can make foci of material that are 50 and 60 nanometers, all in short pulses, and we can take material out of the cell and put it in the vacuum and measure it with conventional means, then we have a way of looking at cells in a way that we've never been able to before. And so possibly the implications were strong for biology.